Good morning, everybody. I have got a screen I'm going to share with you as well. Um, I'm Head of Prevention Services at AGK Enfield. Um, prior to coming to AGK Enfield three years ago, unbelievably, right before the pandemic, um, I've worked with working and adults, older adults, and my specialism is dementia. So I'm quite happy to run a session today and have any questions fired at me, as long as they're not too, too clinical, otherwise I probably will struggle. But it's been my passion, and I was very influenced to work with people with dementia because when I was growing up, my grandfather had dementia, and I've carved out a career in working with people to develop services and, and to develop activities. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much for that, Alison. That's really great. Thanks for just that bit of input. That's really good. Thank you. I hope that operation happens, actually. Okay, let me just share my screen so everyone can see the order of today. No, of course, I can't do that because that's ridiculous, Alison. There we go. Okay. okay, so what to expect from today? When I was putting this together, I thought um, the idea is about what's dementia, types of dementia, signs, symptoms, common behaviours, how to get a diagnosis, what to expect, living well with dementia, challenges, person-centred practice, how to get help, local help. Now, that's very ambitious in about an hour. So um, I will take from the group what you really would like to hear. And But just to set the tone of the session, the current statistics for people living with dementia at the moment in the UK are 944,000, which is a huge amount. And that number has gone up during the pandemic. And we're expected that to be 1.6 million by about 2040. So it's, it's a huge hike. And that trajectory of people developing dementia, I've certainly been... I've been working with people to mention like for the last 28 years. So it's it's steadily increasing. And, and back then in the 90s, we knew there was going to be a huge avalanche of people affected by dementia and it's steadily growing. So one in 14 people over 65 have dementia, but we also know that lots of people under 65 also have dementia as well. So let me just stop sharing for a second because I think it might not show that presentation. The first question I want to pose to you all is when you hear the word dementia, what do you think? And you can shout out to me because I can't see you. So when you hear the word dementia, what do you think, feel or understand? What well, is it? I'll answer. I feel uh, frightened when I hear the word dementia. And yeah. I think about old, very old people uh, wandering around being lost. That's my image of dementia. Mm. I'm going to put things down in the chat so we've got a record of what people are saying. Normally I'll be writing on a board in front of you as we're doing this. Has anybody else got any thoughts, feelings about what dementia means? Have you seen it in a film, um, a television series, a soap opera, real life experiences? What are the kind of like feelings or, or thoughts you have when you hear the word dementia? I think of um, being confused um, not being able to recognize at the extreme end of people, things that you used to do, um, but not being conscious that you're not, you're doing all of these sort of things or not doing all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Conscious and aware, that's really important, isn't it? Thank you for that. Thank you, Olive. And I can see in the chat, there's lots of comments here about someone saying, think you become useless and the liability to society. Um, I think my relative's friends have been affected and confusion, loss. There's lots of very, very powerful words being used in the chat and in your sharing today. What would you say the tone of the words are and the descriptors that people are sharing? How would you, what was your question, Alison? What would you say the tone? How do you, how, what do you think? You know, when all of these words that people have been sharing so far, are they positive or negative? And negative, very negative. Very, very negative, aren't they? Yeah. So is, is there anything positive that anyone could imagine about living with dementia? No. <laughs> okay. Unless you can forget trauma, I suppose. Potentially. That's an interesting one, that. I'm going to put that in the... I'm going to put forget trauma question mark, because that's something I want to come back to you, actually, because that's quite an interesting thing when we think about emotional memory. So let's just hang on to that one. And I'll hopefully this chat will be able to be visible to me as I go along. So, um, Alison, I just know that your mom's with you. So I'm hoping this isn't too negative for her, who's like part of this discussion as well. And just a sensitivity note, if anyone has got somebody who's affected by dementia sitting and joining this session, um, 
we are going to be talking about signs, symptoms and behaviours. So um, if, if, if anybody is affected by that, it, it, it can be quite distressing at times, especially if we think about the later stages of dementia, which is just a, a warning over that, really. So everything that everyone has said here is pretty negative, isn't it? And, and so then this all becomes part of this package of being diagnosed with, with a condition that most people fear or, 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 or are absolutely apprehensive about being diagnosed with. And when you think about fearing something or being apprehensive about something, you're not going to necessarily want to go and seek early interventions to do something about it. So lots of people start to have common symptoms and they do nothing about it because the obvious thing is like, that's frightening. There isn't a cure for this. This is something which, you know, has such a negative societal, even though the outside of society have done tremendous work about campaigning, about living well with dementia and changing the tone and, and, and like the feelings and, and showing very fantastic ambassadors of people who are living with dementia and voices of experience, people still drastically fear it. So that's something that we often kind of like, you know, we need to keep there and keep that as a context. So Alison's got that. Um, my father had it when mum was diagnosed. Okay. Positive is definitely you're spending quality time. Thank you. Oh, and I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, that's lovely. I'm glad she's enjoying this. It worked with John. She's enjoying hope. Um, gradual loss of mental capacity. Thank you, Tony. Absolutely spot on. And often blames on aging. Absolutely. Aging is the, the common misconception of what people think dementia is. Please tell me that when I'm going through this, you, my screen's actually moving. You can see the PowerPoint moving or is it just stuck on one thing? Because sometimes that tends to happen. Can you see this one, which says key facts about dementia? Yes. Perfect. Yes, so, so dementia is an umbrella term and it describes a group of symptoms and most people think about dementia as being disorientation and memory loss um, and then people think about the extremities of like agitation you know the things that come a lot later um, but it's it's a lot more to that and it's very individual to you as an individual because as we grow up we go through different experiences we come from different cultural backgrounds we have different life experiences and we all have different personalities if we were to pay human bingo right now every single person would have a different thing that they like and dislike so there's not no two people the same and certainly for me in, in my career I've never seen anybody the same because nobody is the same and al although there may be similar progressions in, in types and variants of dementia nobody reacts or behaves in the same way and everyone will, will have a very different experience of it so dementia is a progressive disease which means it does get worse and at the beginning quite often people will, will, won't notice that they've got dementia and it will be retrospective that family members will say oh actually I noticed that you know a few years after it can be almost quite insipid and other times it can seem quite sudden because the earlier symptoms again people have a very good social front or they're able to disguise it or they develop coping strategies that get around the things that make you feel um, to display the differences that you might have there are about 200 different types of dementia and dementia being oh. like, you know the, the most um, the umbrella term what do you think is the most common form of dementia Alzheimer's Alzheimer's absolutely and then secondary to that it was always vascular dementia but often now um, when people are diagnosed with dementia they they'll have like a mixed dementia and it can be like you know an Alzheimer's type with a so-and-so strain frontotemporal dementia or FDT is becoming quite a common dementia now and frontotemporal dementia was often called PICS disease. You know, certainly when I first started in the 90s, people often had PICS disease and people who had PICS disease were often younger. There's quite um, a genetic link to it. So it might be that your father or mother may have had that. And it affects people very differently um, so that they, they have aphasia, they, their, their language is affected, but their memory could be quite intact. So there's a lot of word replacement going on, but also there's a lot of um, disinhibition. Wow. So hi Are you there um but with the disinhibition it, it comes a personality change and, and and the front of temple dementia group of activists um often say that it affects people that are very high functioning or surgeons you know um people who are um in really high pressured or functioning pilots you know people with very responsible jobs um and people think it's a midlife crisis because there's a personality change. It might be that somebody's, you know, had a criminal conviction for the first time in their life. It could be that they, they, they buy something very impulsively 
um, and people often think, oh, you know, they, 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 they tend to be younger. So people think it's a bit of a midlife crisis or something going on with them. And, and actually, certainly when you listen to people's stories about how they struggle to get a diagnosis of frontal temporal dementia, there's this kind of very sudden changed behavior. There was a chap I was working with when I was in Waltham Forest and he was a school teacher and he was a, he was a very, very dedicated school teacher. Um, and he worked with young people and he suddenly started to use inappropriate language and so a safeguarding was raised and he was dismissed from his job um, and it later transpired that he got diagnosis of dementia so it, it's a very interesting form of dementia thank you Tony I will do that um, dementia isn't a natural part of aging um, it's caused by a disease that damages nerve cells in the brain. So when people say, oh, I just think someone so is getting old or it's just, it's just part of getting old and it, and it will happen to everybody as you get older. That's not true. That's a misconception. Um, and it's caused by many, many different diseases that affect the brain and they affect the brain in different ways. And because obviously there's different parts of the brain and every part of the brain has a, has a different operating function. There isn't a cure for dementia, but early detection intervention can help a person. So what I'm going to do now is stop sharing this and I'm going to show you a very short video because it stops you hearing my voice all the time. So let me just come across to that and let's just show this to you. It's a lovely Australian video, so you have a different accent to mine for five seconds. And you should be able to hear this. Tell me. Ah, Alzheimer's disease vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies. Understanding the symptoms can help in ensuring each person's care needs are met. No two people experience dementia in the same way. What are the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? In the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, symptoms may be very subtle. You may notice lapses in memory, and difficulty in finding the right words for everyday objects. Symptoms can fluctuate and can become worse at times of stress. Other symptoms may include forgetting well-known people or places, deterioration in social skills, loss of enthusiasm for previously enjoyed activities, and emotional unpredictability. What are the symptoms of vascular dementia? Vascular dementia is the broad term which describes dementia associated with problems of circulation of blood in the brain. Symptoms vary depending on the part of the brain where blood flow is impaired and often overlap with other types of dementia. These include confusion, difficulty with concentration and memory, restlessness, agitation and depression. Sometimes an increase in symptoms occurs following a series of strokes, but they may also progress in a gradual, steady decline. What are the symptoms of frontotemporal dementia? Frontotemporal dementia is a term used to describe disorders that primarily affect the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain, which causes them to shrink or weaken. These areas of the brain are generally associated with personality, behaviour and language. People can have dramatic changes in their personality, making them impulsive, lack inhibition and have repetitive compulsive behaviours together with difficulty with speech and language. What are the symptoms of dementia with Lewy bodies? Lewy body dementia is the second most common type of progressive dementia after Alzheimer's disease. Protein deposits, called Lewy bodies, develop in cells in the areas of the brain involved in thinking, memory and movement. Symptoms may include visual hallucinations, rigid muscles, slow movement, walking difficulty and tremors similar to Parkinson's disease. To find out more, go to opalhealthcare.com.au. So I thought that was a lovely, concise video and it breaks up my voice, but it pretty much goes over what we were saying earlier. So when you think about somebody you know that's had dementia, can you think about them experiencing any of those signs and symptoms? Can you think of anybody you know that's had anything like that? 
because the, the difficulty is is that sometimes people fear having dementia and actually there is something else which could be going on with them the, the key factor about having being formally diagnosed with dementia is it's consistent it's a consistent um behavior that's that's happening over a period of time and it's deteriorating so if you are to go to a long to a, to a doctor you need to have a diary of events and a diary of things that are happening and quite often, like exactly, exactly as they mentioned about Alzheimer's disease, some of those things are very, very subtle. And it's only when you look back at it, you can actually see that it's happening. If somebody starts presenting with quite acute symptoms, it could be more like it's a, um, an, a, you know, an infection or a urine infection or a chest infection or something that's caused a delirium. Um, you know, people who are in their, you know, 50s and 60s that could be experiencing extreme stress at work or vitamin de deficiency or who drink a lot or experiencing menopause can have very classic symptoms of like early dementia as well so there's lots of things that can also be like a pseudo dementia but aren't a dementia and can be treated and resolved but it's important that if you are sort of having continued symptoms of something that you go to your doctor and have them checked out so let me go back to my slides just to keep myself on track as you can tell i can easily come off track because it's something i feel very passionate about so signs, symptoms and behaviours, as we've mentioned before, that everyone's very different, um, but memory loss. And it's always about short term things. So so people who are affected by dementia, um, I often think about this and we used to say like a filing cabinet in the olden days. We had these you know, roller decks or filing cabinets and you'd have the files at the front, which are your most common, most, you know, um, present memories so like what I had for breakfast what I'm wearing today etc there your memories at the front and so further back you go into the filing cabinet your memories over the years and you know the deeper back you go the more that those memories retain because when you think about it um, all of those memories in the front you know especially things which are like temporary files you know things that you have to do and, and I actually think nowadays because we do so much more our brains can't retain the huge amount of things that we do so lots of things that are temporary files will go first of all but our more emotive memories are the things that we retain which is quite why often people will talk to you about am I going back home um, and, and they're thinking about a home that they lived at 30 years ago because of the emotional attachment to that People always say you'll always remember how someone treats you. And I think that's absolutely true. You always tend to remember something which is very emotive to you, be that good or bad. And to take that back to one of the comments which was in the chat earlier about forgetting trauma. Actually, our brains are very, very clever. And while our brains are functioning well, we can actually push aside trauma. We can work through some very difficult things that happen to us in our lives. Um, when we're fully functioning but as our brain deteriorates or our brain ages and our brain um, is affected by disease those kind of skills and coping strategies that we've developed to keep those horrible intrusive thoughts away deteriorate and fail too so that's why you'll often find people who may have had anxiety all their life and had very good coping strategies to cope you know to cope with those kind of behaviors have a great social front lose that and become very very anxious or somebody that's experienced a trauma, like, you know, somebody's died or, or, or they've been assaulted and they've put that to one side and nobody knows about it and they've kept that very secretive, that can suddenly been, be revealed and they relived a trauma and, and appear to go through a PTSD. There was a woman I worked with again when I was in Wolfram Forest and her, this is, this is years ago, I and mean, this is back in the 90s, and at the time she was in her late 80s and her mother used to have an illegal abortion clinic so she had real PTSD about bleach and like she was always scrubbing her hands because she could remember the people coming to her house. And that would have been something which would have been shamefully buried, but also because it was an illegal practice, it would have been something she would have certainly been told don't even talk about it. But as she then developed dementia, the ability to keep that retained you know, just disappeared. And so that became something that she spoke about. So, so the brain is a very, very complex and very interesting um, there's another thing with a gentleman who um, was divorced and it was a painful divorce and so he kind of like shut off all the memories connected to that part of the family and again you know when he de developed dementia all of that came back out again so there's, there's some incredible things that do, that do go on with people and certainly families definitely struggle with, with signs and some of the behaviors of people because it's like that's not my dad that's not my mom that's not something they've done before that doesn't make sense to me and there are lots of things like that. Sorry, you're about to say something, I think, somebody. I heard a comment there. Has anyone got any, can anyone relate to that? Is that? Does that sound like something anyone's lived through? Has anyone seen that relatives got behaviours that are very, very different to what they're used to? Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely. I, I can tell you a million stories like that. 
you know, literally a million stories of somebody that's never sworn in their life and then suddenly is very disinhibited and, and the use of language. And, and that, again, is, is, is a lot down to temporal lobes. So we let our left is all around language. And when, when we learn, we retain all of our language skills in our left. And if the temporal lobe of the left is impaired and affected, we start to lose those language skills, but we, we retain our right. Right is our rhythm, which is why singing for the brain and anything musical is so important. So if you start to you know, deteriorate with your speech, you'll always be able to retain rhythm. So it's, you know, we've, we've done lots of work with people where we tap, and when we tap, we talk like this. And when we talk, we talk like this. And people are more able to talk. You can't have a sentence. But when you're using rhythm, they can or, or you can retain singing. But the interesting thing about the right temporal lobe as well is that it keeps collected words that you've rejected from your left. So you may have been told, don't say that, it's offensive. Don't use that word. It's a swear word or it's racist or it's sexist or anything which is negative was rejected from your left language skills because your social ability knew that that's not appropriate to use that, but it's stored as a backup in your right. So if you lose your left, your right will bring out some backup, which is why people suddenly say racist things or sexist things, or they swear because they're trying to replace. So the things have gone from the left, they'll pop out from the right. And, and that's quite an interesting thing to think about too, about some people's behavior. So bear that one in mind, because it's, it's quite important. But certainly when you've got um, somebody you're working with or a family member who, who's really struggling to speak, then you'll find that you know rhythm music is, is so important and, it, and you really can do a lot with that. And you'll notice that if somebody ha is, has got quite a lot of nonverbal ability, they'll always be able to tap along and stay in beats and music and then language will come out from that. You know, it comes out in, in familiar songs. It's, it's, it's a really interesting thing. And there's lots of musical um, videos on YouTube that I can share with you about that as well. Has anyone got any questions about this so far? I'm aware I talk a lot. Someone's put in there about overfriendly of the opposite sex. Absolutely. And um, we run memory meetups like fortnightly in the borough and we have lots of couples that attend. And it's it's fair to say that's quite a common a common concern. And, and I can see every time that the, the carer, the, 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 the wife or the husband is absolutely mortified by this behavior. It's, it's embarrassing and it, it creates shame. And But it is a part of the condition and it is part of, not, not necessarily for everybody, but if your brain's impacted and infected in that way, then you're sort of like loss of social understanding of your behavior being inappropriate. I always feel like when a person, um, is a, you know, is disinhibited in that way, they would probably be mortified if they knew they were behaving in that way. You know, but it, but it's it's the way that you react as as a person to, to you know not go along with situations like that, but not confront. There's, there's a very person centered way of work, of reacting and working with people. You know, it's, it, that's that's another conversation to keep going when we get to different realities as well. But I think certainly that's one of the challenges of of living with dementia. One of those behaviours. Um, as dementia deteriorates, you know, people always commonly think about memory loss, but there's lots of things like making cups of teas, you know, concentrating, planning, organizing, you know, all the fact that we have different um, abilities and we're always trying to do about 10 things at once in life. So when you think about it, when, you know, how many steps does it take to make a cup of tea? Let's pose that as a question to stop me talking for a minute. How many steps do you think it takes to make a cup of tea? Take you, someone said, I think Jan, you said nine. Did you say nine? I was reading your lips, yeah. Yes, nine. Said about nine. Anybody, anyone higher than nine? Anyone got any increase on nine or less than nine? I can take um, I've got my cup of tea, so I'm relishing you all thinking about this one for a moment. How many, how many steps do you think it took me to, to, to like to negotiate making a cup of tea? Five. By four. Okay, let's think about it. First of all, I have to think I want a cup of tea. So that's one. Then I have to think, where's my kitchen? That's two. I have to think about getting into my kitchen. That's three. I have to think about possibly turning on the light. That's four. I have to think about where the cup was stored. I have to think about where the tea was stored. I have to think about where the sugar stored. I have to think about where the milk is stored. I have to think about how I open that. I have to think about where the water is. I have to think where the kettle is. I have to switch the kettle on. I'm going to keep going. 
it's about 40 things that are in making a cup of tea. And if you think about that right now, if you were to go off and make a cup of tea, you'd also be thinking to yourself, I wonder what my daughter's doing today. I wonder what time I have to do this. And you've got a million things happening at your in your brain at any one time. But when you actually think about somebody who then starts to have an illness, which is shrinking their brain or deteriorating aspects in their brain, um, then you can imagine how complicated and how that starts, starts, starts to break down. But when we work with people, we meet them halfway or we meet them where their needs are. So rather than taking away a skill that someone has, you try and retain their skill and keep them doing. So it could be that the person puts the cup out themselves and you pour the water in, but then the person puts the tea bag in and you work with the person's needs. So you always give the person the best experience. Tony saying, Alison. Yes, Tony. Uh, take green tea. If you drink green tea, it'll cut down the number of steps you have to do. <laughs> That's a very good idea, actually, Tony. I completely agree with you. If you drink herbal tea or ginger tea or something like that, you haven't got to worry about the milk at least, have you, or whether the milk's out date, etc. But um, Alison, actually, you win the prize because you're on 20 there. And Rosa, I love this. You have coffee in the morning, tea at midday, and last tea before going to bed. That's not enough hydration, though. You need a bit more hydration there. Someone was telling me the other day that on average we need two litres, but as we get older, we need to have more. And again, you always find that older people drink less because there's a fear about going to the toilet, not being able to get up quick enough, or they don't drink before they go out. And there's, again, all of this, and all of this sits with our sort of like fear. We, we, we fear having accidents and making fools of ourselves. But actually without enough water and hydration in our body, we actually make things worse for ourselves and we can get more confused. So there's a lot of benefits of green tea though, Tony. I completely agree with that. It really, really is. It's a really good thing to have. Um, staying on track, difficulty staying on track should be my one. But but do you see what I mean? It's like um, I have a lot of information in my head at any one time. And you can imagine that, you know, I, I have word finding difficulties because I'm going through the menopause. And, and, you know, I think to myself sometimes what your brain will do when you when you have word finding difficulties, I have good days and bad days. Um, your brain will try and look for something as a substitute. So it's like, you know, I remember one time I couldn't remember what a lawnmower was called. And I kept saying to myself, it's 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 like a hoover, but it cuts the grass because my brain's trying to look for something which looks something similar. So it's like if you forget the name of a pen, you'll be looking for an instrument that looks like that. Your brain's going through these files to try and connect them back up and try and find something to associate it. And the more your brain has a disease and loses those those words or those abilities to connect other things, the worse it becomes. And then you start replacing with very unusual things like rather than thingy bobs or you're, you're sometimes replaced with something completely different. There was a woman I was working with who used the word French. She, she'd lose words and she'd always say French. It's one of those French. Well, it's a French and you'd have to try and decipher what French meant. Sometimes you can kind of get what someone's at, but when they're replacing with something completely different, it's a lot, lot harder. So is this making sense to everybody? Is this, yes. Is it, is it helpful? Brilliant. Wonderful. So language, Alison. yes, I can hear somebody saying Alison, what you, yeah, it's me. I'm about Alison. Hi, Alison. What you were saying about, I mean, I'm, I'm of an age <laughs> and I'm not sure whether I'm going through or have been through the menopause but there are times when I'm literally trying to talk about something like you were describing the, the, the lawnmower I don't mix up names or anything like that although I do call my husband my son and, and various <laughs> all the boys in my family I go no no that one but it, it, it was interesting what you were saying about like menopause and also you've mentioned about depression and things yes and, and sometimes I think oh is it really is it really dementia or, is, or has it been that or has it been this and yeah. things like that? It's yeah. to find out where it comes from, I suppose. I think I think the key thing is about um consistent, you know, like you know, but saying that, I mean menopause is a horrible debilitating condition too, and it can last, you know, 10, 15 years, God help us all. But oh, you know, and, and you know, and symptoms of that vary and change, but I th I think the the key thing about a, a dementia trajectory is that it deteriorates. And it, you know, it, it deteriorates in different ways. And so, you know, that with a vascular dementia, they always talk about it being more like steps. So you'll be all right for a little while, then there's a deterioration, and then you'll be all right for a little while, then there's a deterioration. So it looks like a bit like a staircase, whereas if with more like an Alzheimer's type, it's a steady deterioration over time. And, and again, the, the younger you are when you develop a dementia, sometimes the quicker, you know, you deteriorate or, or your symptoms are more profound and notable. Um, Unfortunately, there's, there's certain types of dementia where people become more agitated. It's just, again, where parts of your brain are affected. Um, but, but then again, it also depends on you as a personality. Again, you know, sometimes some of people's behavior, behavior is always reactive to how you feel. 
So, you know, people are often reactive to how they're being spoken to, how they're being treated, how they're frustrated. And we've come a long way with dementia care. There's a lot more counselling. There's a lot more support and advice available. People know they have to mention that they have to mention now. People are told it's disclosed to them. When I first started working with people with dementia, this is like back in the early 90s and person centred care was just coming out. A person wasn't necessarily told they had dementia, but their family members were. And so there'd be people saying to me, I just don't feel right. I I feel like there's something in my head. I feel fizzy. And I'd say, what do you think it could be? But they bear in mind, they've not been told by the doctor. Their family members have been told and they hadn't. Whereas if now you're, you're told, you're absolutely told whether you can retain that or cope with that or whether you can understand that depending on where you're at but you are told and there's lots of people living well with dementia because they feel that because they're aware of what's happening with them they've they've developed coping strategies you know people work with dementia people drive with dementia there there, there seems to be a, a, a difference so back then I think people were probably spotted later and by that point already they were at you know at a stage where they, they, they were very impaired but it depends when you know when you're spotted but yeah I mean menopause stress you know vitamin deficiencies um they all impact memory and so people have this whole thing about forgetting words or forgetting things you often find people that are overworked or stressed they'll have sort of like classic symptoms but not necessarily anything else and so it's like you know having numerous symptoms and then being consistent and there being the deterioration and over a prolonged period of time that's when you start going actually something's going on here but people do have a lot of anxiety too I mean I had a neighbor when I was growing up and she was always frightened to death she was going to get dementia and she was so hyper aware of what the signs and symptoms and behaviors were it kind of produced an anxiety in her then when you get that anxiety it kind of mirrors different behaviors too so like I said our brain brain is very very um, powerful Jenny's written something really interesting in the chat here um caffeine is not dementia friendly 100% Jenny I really agree with that caffeine's not friendly full stop like I'm on decaf myself at the moment um, because when I am overworking my anxiety levels and probably because of menopausal too, my anxiety levels can raise and, and I'm very caffeine sensitive. So, it, you know, it, it just depends on everybody, but hundred percent there, you know, valuable water, fruits and vegetables, healthy living is, is very, very important. So thank you for that. Um, Alison, I'll attest to track the progression of dementia. That's really interesting, Tony, actually. Um, I don't, I mean, there possibly are so many apps now, actually, you know, it's like technology has advanced so much that there probably are, but I mean, commonly what they would do would be, you know, you're presenting with symptoms, you get the courage or you get forced along sometimes in some people's cases, you you, you know, or you go yourself, you're self-determined to go and have a dementia assessment. You go, you know, you go along to a GP, a GP will do bloods um, initially to make sure there isn't something else going on with you. Um, and then you'll be referred for a CT or MRI scan, and then you'll have an um, assessment at Enfield Memory Service. Um, and then the discussion will be about what kind of type of dementia it possibly be. They always kind of like look to what type of dementia it is. And often now they'll either go, you know, mixed dementia. And I really feel the reason why lots of people talk about things being a mixed dementia is because they can give you medication, which was predominantly prescribed for Alzheimer's. So if you have a mixed dementia, they can trial you on this type of medication, which definitely delays the progress of dementia. So we've come a long way that that's routinely prescribed. Again, when I first started working with people with dementia, you'd have a private prescription for that. And you'd have to see the, the same local authority consultant privately to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to obtain that medication, but it's commonly prescribed. And there's different medications that they work in combination with that now. And it's very trial and error. And sometimes the medications, there's, there's a medication that will delay at the progress of dementia for some types of dementia only. So some, some like Terry Pratchett, he had, um, sorry, I've forgotten the type it was now, but it was a very rare type of dementia that about 12 people in the UK have, and there's, there's no medication that will prevent that from happening or delay that. And vascular dementia at the moment is trials to try and slow that down as well. But I always think with interventions, there's, there's always a lot of you know, money being put into dementia research to try and improve things and slow things down. There probably are amazing apps now that can track progression I think, because, you know, back then there wasn't, you'd have this dementia test and then somebody would then go back to their GP because there was a behaviour that challenged or or a behaviour that people, were, I can't cope, something's happening here. So the memory service will do an assessment of you. Um, they'll, you know, you'll, you'll perhaps attend a living well with dementia course or a cognitive stimulation therapy course. They'll refer you to AGK, who's got the memory care navigators. And sometimes you don't want any of that. And you go off and you do your own thing and then things 
deteriorate and then you want to come back and access services and generally what people do then is they come back to their GP or they come to a voluntary sector charity or maybe they go to adult social care and say I can't cope with this behaviour and sometimes the behaviour means that the older people's mental health team will get involved to look at what that challenging behaviour might be or the behaviour that challenges and they might prescribe a different medication which just takes the edge off things and we've come a huge way from where we were in the 90s there Back in the 90s, there was a medication that would always be prescribed to people that would just knock them out. There's no question about it. And it would restrict them. And the side effects of that caused another condition, which was quite alarming. So, you know, and there was a lot of what we'd say is chemical caution going on with people that were in care homes where they were given too much of this medication, which, which then caused falls. And it was a very, very negative experience. And we've come a long way from there. It's not perfect, but we have certainly come a long way from there. I think the education, you know, people's awareness of dementia, dementia has become a more common understood disease. It's, it, you know, people know about it. It's the Alzheimer's do a very good dementia action week every year. And the, the advert this year was very, very powerful. So there's a lot more awareness of people and people commonly talk about it. People know they've got family members involved, but you know, 28 years ago when I first started, it was still very stigmatized like cancer and people didn't want to have conversations about it. So to, to answer it in a very long way, Tony, there probably is it's something I'll probably go from Google when I come out of this and, and it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, certainly researchers have participants that will track their own feelings and behavior by, by you know, using tests or on apps. So it might be that they periodically do that so then they can see it. But it's, it's you, know, you can see it's, it's despite it being such a disgusting and debilitating illness for so many people, it's actually quite fascinating to try and understand dementia and how it affects us as, as people. But maybe that's just me because I'm a bit of a dementia geek. Um, to come back onto my track, as you can kind of see, I get very passionate about dementia and I come off track and I have to keep myself on. Um, misunderstanding what's being seen is a really common thing. So... Um, you know perception is interesting can anybody think of anything which might be a challenge to someone with, with, with dementia what kind of things might people see incorrectly around the home or in shops or places that you visit i find um my mum has very in-depth conversations with the characters on rosemary and time and why she loves watching detection shows Right. And then she'll start having a very, I told you, I warned you, which is not far off what I'm like. And I'm watching <laughs> television and going, I knew, it, I knew it was that, but she's actually there. And also what that video FaceTime doesn't work for her. Yes, oh, definitely. Yes, De technology. I mean, technology, again, it's, it's just a blessing and a curse, isn't it? So we've come a long way with technology. But I did this really interesting project with people about selfies so, you know, front-facing cameras and selfies to sort of like capture people, how they were feeling. And if you're, if you're in a different reality, if, you're, if you think you're an 18-year-old man, but you're an 80-year-old man, being faced by seeing yourself in, in your front-facing camera or in the mirror can be quite distressing, you know, because, you, you know, you, you're suddenly thinking, that's my dad, that's my granddad I'm looking at. If that's where your reality is and, and, and people are sometimes in, in the correct reality and sometimes in a different reality and it can fluctuate through the course of the day and sometimes that doesn't affect people at all but if you are then then that's a massive reality shock actually and as practitioners we moved away from there's a thing called reality orientation and you, you know again when I first started working with people's dementia there was reality orientation boards everywhere you went it's Tuesday it's 10 30 it's about to rain you know trying to keep people reins into where they should be and you know, there's, there's some awful stories about, you know, when people say that they've forgotten that their loved ones died. There was this awful situation where someone once put in their glasses case, your mum's dead. So every time they opened the glasses case, they were presented with a note that said your mum's dead. And, you know, so then you're going to relive that every single time you read the note. And you can, you know, you can understand why the person did it, because they thought, oh, I have to keep telling her all the Hello? time that's where her mum is. And so that's why that's why she wrote it. But can you imagine constantly reliving the, the loss of someone that you love every single time? And so everyone's kind of moved away from this kind of like reality orientation and, and meeting people where they need to be met. And that does not mean we collude with people because collusion is another thing. So if someone's telling you that when people have visual hallucinations and they say, oh, there's a child sitting at the end of my sofa, if you go, oh, yeah, that's a lovely child, isn't it? then you're colluding with somebody. And if a person's reality then changes again, they won't believe you, they won't trust you because you've indulged in something which was, wasn't real. 
but confronting them and saying, don't be so stupid, that's not there, it's not going to help either. But having a conversation with someone about, oh, I can, what, what, what do you think is there? And sort of like, oh, I can see why you might think that by the way that the sun shines in or something might lead someone to actually recognising that isn't the case. So especially things around visual perceptions, visual perceptions are like a dark map and like a whole... There's lots of you know, care homes that are very tasteful now, actually, but in the past to have awful flooring where a person might think, oh, it's the, the floor's melting or I'm going to get lost in the flooring or mirrors, not just mirrors, but reflective, like, you know, picture frames with reflective glass where you, you see someone different or see someone else. Sometimes lampshades, things that, you know, you know, if you're tired yourself out the corner of your eye, you catch them thinking, you're like, I'm not quite sure if that's there or not that's a perception or difficulty that someone with dementia might experience as well. So there, there are lots of challenges, both for the person living with dementia and their family members and how you how you deal with those kind of situations. And I know someone was trying to talk there, actually. So there's somebody, somebody had something to say. Has anyone got any thoughts about this? Visual perceptions. Dementia hereditary. It can be, Tony. Um, it, it can be, but not necessarily. Again, like with cancers, the, you know, the, the genetic tests that you can have to define whether, you know, and again with cancer, cancer because it's one in two people, one in 14 people have got dementia. Um, sometimes it's, co it's coincidental. Sometimes it, it, it's, it's like anything, we, you know, we don't necessarily, although we, that's coming, we don't necessarily know what we're predisposed to, but um, our genetics and health inequalities which they will be able to start testing and seeing which we're more predetermined for most definitely as science is moving forward. But um, I've been around the block a long time, as I've said to you, I think in, in all that time, I've worked with three people that it was genetic and they were all frontal temporal dementia. So they were all what was then Pick's disease and they were all below 40 or 50 when, the, when it, when it started and so were their parents. So it's, you know, it's, it's far more common in that way, but Alzheimer's types, you know, I've seen less hereditary forms. But, it, but it, they do happen, but it's not so common. But people worry about that. My dad worried about that. My granddad had, had dementia and my dad was absolutely paranoid that was going to be him and it wasn't. You know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. OK, I've come definitely off my own track. As I told you, I'm very passionate about dementia, so I knew that this was going to happen. And um, can anyone think about moods and behaviours that you, you attach to dementia, how people feel? Is there anything that people think about commonly which that uh, people express um agitation is very common people think about agitation and irritability but when you think about agitation and irritability it's cause and effect there's always something which will trigger that and sometimes it, it's down to you know feeling frustrated with yourself at the time having a conscious awareness that things are not going in the way that you want them to you know but if you equally think that you're an 18 year old, but actually you're an 88 year old, someone correcting you is, is going to make that a, a trigger. Um, aggression, certainly. Feeling, fear of being left alone, absolutely, and afraid of the dark. And, and the evening's a really interesting thing, isn't it, Frankie? Because um, people talk about sundowners, where often people are worse at the latter part of the day. Um, and they, you know, they, they'll either have nocturnal wandering, that, that fear, in the evenings that you want to get out you want to get home and that's absolutely a fear because even though you're in your home and you might have lived in your home for 50 years in your emotional memory you possibly then are in a different reality and think you're younger and you want to get back to your mum and your dad because that's security so lots of language that people use is around expression so when people say i want to i want to get home to my mum and my dad or um you know something which attaches back to early years that's normally more of an expression of feeling anxious or insecure or something around your circumstances is making you feel that way there's a fantastic film you could all watch with anthony hopkins in it i don't know if anyone's seen that the father it's not the air jans but i think got her thumb up it's an amazing film and it's very subtle and clever and it really gives you the lived experience of what someone's going through Jenny, absolutely. When your parents are not in the country of origin, 100% and people, you know, loss of language going back to their original language skills, but then their original language skills or their original language, you know, is lost with the sort of muddle of dementia too. Um, there, was, there was a guy who came to us when I was working in Redbridge and, and he was um, Sri Lankan and, and he had a very unusual dialect of Tamil and one of my team spoke Tamil, but his, his language skills were so muddled. But also he'd been very, very shielded and protected by the family as he'd been diagnosed with dementia and never accessed any help or support at all. Then his wife had had an emergency admission to hospital. And so he was brought along to a day service so that he could be supported in the day so his children could work. And this guy was terrified. 
who'd never had any formal support and he's speaking a different language and dialect to anybody else. He'd never known formal services. And all he wanted to do was literally run out of the building and he was clambering against walls. And, you know, we're very person-centered practitioners, but if you think about it, it's, it's like, you wouldn't have even begun to realize what was going on with you. All he wants to do is be with his wife and his wife is in the hospital and he couldn't be with her. So he literally managed to get out of the building and we had to drive alongside him as he walked up the road to try and, you know, one of us was on the pavement trying to stop him from going into the world. So panicked he was to get away from him because we would have been his captors and, you know, not been able to express yourself too. It's, it's horrific. So I often say to people that um, our carers start to introduce somebody as early as possible. Even if that person is coming to a group, even if that person is coming in to do a bit of housework, you're extending and widening your circle. And that's really important because God forbid you have an emergency admission. And then for, for you, it's traumatic because you're thinking, who can I leave my loved one with? But for the person that you're caring for, they haven't got that recognition. and It's not familiar to them. There's, there's no kind of like pot place. So that's a really simple tip for anyone to think of. If, if you're diagnosed with dementia or someone's diagnosed with dementia, immediately think about those circles of support, start building on those and, and make those introductions, even if it's for half an hour. And if a person comes along and goes, well, bloody hate that group, it's awful. It, it's, it's still widening in it. And there's other people there that will be feeling the same as you. So those are really simple tips. Um, Jenny's put something else as well. People feeling embarrassed what's happened and parents hiding them away, absolutely. Absolutely is. One of the things I've put on a slide here, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be very brief, um, was about challenges. You know, what's the biggest challenge of living with dementia and stigma and what other people think is, is one of them, certainly. Um, sometimes it's about your own place where you acknowledge that I'm not the person that I was. And that's so debilitating to have that kind of feeling about yourself can be can be limiting. But quite often it's about other people's expectations of you or lack of expectations of you, other people's misconceptions of dementia, other people's stigma of dementia, shame and guilt. And all of those kind of emotional things can be real challenges for people affected by dementia. There was a woman I was working with and she was Irish and she said to me, because I said to her, you're, you, you know, you're amazing that you're able to talk about your lived experience. And she goes, yeah, but those of my friends don't want to talk to me anymore because they know I've got dementia. And so they're frightened. And you find that you find that in independent living or sheltered housing people won't sit next to somebody or they won't come along to an event because somebody there and imagine you being that person you know and it's the same with any long-term condition certainly the same with you know people with cancer sometimes people don't know how to or someone who's lost a loved one people themselves don't know how to react so they avoid the person so it all comes down to our own feelings so that's why education awareness is really important tony thank you what support is available to people so if you're worried about your memory, the first step is that you go to see your GP and the GP will do a test with you. Um, and if they, if they feel that you're eligible to have further testing, they refer you to Enfield Memory Service. If you're diagnosed with dementia from Enfield Memory Service, we have, AJK UK Enfield um, has a contract with the clinical commissioning group to support people who are newly diagnosed. And so we will work with somebody from point of diagnosis there. We'll also work with someone who's diagnosed with dementia at any point, because like I say, some people are like, I'm absolutely great, don't need any help, and they go off. And then what tends to happen is, is a little while later, they'll come back. Um, so AJK Enfield has memory navigators or health and wellbeing navigators that can support somebody with dementia, and they'll help them with coping strategies, um, you know, income maximization, security, housing, later life planning, all, all of those things, but also connect to people, understanding coping strategies, all of that. Then our good colleagues at Enfield Carer Centre do fantastic work around supporting carers who are affected by dementia and they have monthly groups. The Older People's Mental Health Team are in the process of developing a carers group. The Older People's Mental Health Team have an admiral nurse. I think they've still got one part-time admiral nurse who's around. And an admiral nurse will work with carers of people affected by dementia to sort of like, you know, to join up stuff around medication, connecting to the community, et cetera. The Alzheimer's Society don't work in the same way that they used to years ago. I used to work for the Alzheimer's Society, so I know it. Um, but they have fantastic sessions like Singing for the Brain. And the Alzheimer's Society are always your go-to place about information. They have amazing resources, fact sheets. They have online forums. They have lots of information. And because they are the leading experts on dementia, there is not anything they can't share with you. And if you ever have a question about dementia that you're really stuck on, they have a knowledge hub and they're, and they're fantastic there. So, so locally, 
there is a huge array of dementia friendly activities in the borough. So the Rotary Clubs have sessions, um, <clears throat> start ch quite choking now. Um, I can send you a list of dementia friendly activities that run. There's literally an activity for people affected by dementia every day, which is like a cafe kind of club lunch, you know, experience. There's day services like the Parker Centre and Rose Taylor. Um, then you'll have things like Jewish care, which are just on the outside, but will still support people. There are amazing care homes like Elsing House, which are opening up the facilities so that us from the community can go and do joint work there too. So not just you move in there, they're allowing us to use. So we're looking to develop a cinema there. So there's lots of opportunity. Um, and this, yes, that, so yes, short, you can email me and I'll send you all that information at all. Yes, Maureen, we can send that information. I can send a list to you, Jan, no problem at all. You can put it on the website. Yes, you'll share my contact details. How do you manage negative talk from a dementia, someone experiencing dementia? Frankie, that's a really interesting point. Um, when you talk about negative talk, are they talking about themselves? Are they thinking about somebody? Are they, are they, are they talking negatively about okay. their situation? Um, they're talking uh, negatively about things that's happened in the past. Okay. Like they keep repeating it, um, and it's 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 never it's never positive talk. It's always uh, so you can't you you fear of having a conversation with that person because you know within two, three, four, five minutes, it's going to end up in uh, a negative conversation about someone who did, you, you talked about, you know, you always remember the good things that uh, that someone's done for you, but you, but this person always remembers the bad things. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. yeah, how can you, like, how can you move them along from that? Because if you say you don't want to hear it, mm -hmm. uh, then they get upset. Yeah. Is it is it something that someone's done to them? Is it something or their perception of somebody? I mean, this is probably a conversation we can have outside. I'm quite yeah. happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I'll give you in I'll give you my email address. I mean, I'll put it in the chat and check me an email and we'll arrange a conversation because it, it's gonna probably take longer than the time that we've got left. And I, I appreciate that because I don't want I don't want to cut you short. And I think there's probably some coping strategies we can give you that. Um it is really difficult because the thing is that person's expressing, aren't they? So it's a feeling they're expressing. And, and the hardest thing I think about being a loved one and, and a good professional, because let's just be honest, there are bad professionals who don't give people time, but a good professional would validate. You're validating what that person said to you. And so then you'd use things like that must make you feel like, but that's just, that's because you're a professional that's going to clock off at a certain time. And when you're a 24 seven carer, that's a completely different thing altogether. So the, the, you know but there are things that we can do around that i put my email address in there the only reason i put my I haven't put my mobile in guys is because i can't actually remember my number which is pretty awful isn't it i've got a new mobile i don't know what it is but if you email me i will give you my mobile number as well okay. my, bra my brain's not perfect believe me it has a lot of information in it but um this is a see what i mean it's a very very quick overview that i can talk about dementia for hours and days and there's different things that'll be really useful but do get in touch and if there's anything else i can help you all with and jan i'm always and chris i'm always happy to do another follow-up session about something else which is bespoke if it helps you can see why it goes time has gone really quickly this morning hasn't it yes indeed Thank you, Alison. Um, your talk was really informative and wide ranging and also thanks to everyone who's contributed. Um, anyone got any more questions or comments that they want to make? Can I make a quick comment? Of course. Um, yeah, thank you so much as well. Um, my friend alerted me to this, so thanks, Amon. Um, and my mum's a, a, a person that has dementia um alzheimer's and i think what frankie said is really interesting and I, I do a lot of work around um pelvic floor um menopause and just the mental emotional and the history and the trauma that's locked inside of them so one of the things that happens obviously with with alzheimer's patients um well some alzheimer's patients all is if they've had some trauma in their past as in okay. the person that you're maybe working with frankie um that's what that's what tends to come up It's unfortunately the negative history that's been buried for ages tends to surface in this climate so it's 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 kind of stressful for for the person hearing it because you think you know get over it but that person they, that part of the brain just seems to be on rewind and replay so maybe just using things like music so if i find my mum takes herself to a sort of negative point I will try to change the topic or I'll put some music on and a song that she likes and all of a sudden sometimes she may stay there for a while but we try to put like music on or yeah. you know something different that will just take her mind to another place and usually again there's old old records that they remember from yesteryear and all of a sudden 
you know, it may take a few moments, but they take themselves to that point and that can just divert them. They're going to come back to it because it's on replay, but at least you've got that. So you just got to replay the same record. And all of a sudden Definitely. you're stuck on the same record yourself as well. But Definitely it so. kind of takes them away from where they are and it helps you. Jenny, I think we've got a mutual friend of Leary. Is Leary your friend as well? Oh my God, yes. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. I thought I recognised your name as well. I've recognised your picture. But absolutely, you're Jenny, 100% right. Let's connect because I'd like to talk to you about menopause too. But I'm also noticing the more I'm working with people in the menopause that... 100% I knew this was the case because when I first started working with people with dementia, I soon realised that actually there was a lot of res resolution work I was doing with people. So like, you mm. know, I realised that people were confiding in things to me that they hadn't shared with their family members and they were letting out things that they'd kept for a very long time, especially the generations of people I was working with then. Imagine they would have been in their 80s, 90s and the 90s. So it was a very repressed society. But I can see now from working with menopausal groups of women that it's a pause in your life which suddenly it stacks out all this trauma that people have lived with and they get to like you know 40 50 60 and they're suddenly like I can't cope with that so it's like almost if we do resolution work at this age we'll prevent it later on which is a progression from where we're at with older people before so it's really important so please get in touch with me I'd love to do some work I've, I've that, saved your so. email and I, I was you. on a, a clubhouse thing this morning talking about menopause and last night and it really is such an emotive topic but if we understand the, the relationship to where we find ourselves and the past traumas, 100%. I think we're in a great place now because people are beginning to speak. And so we can, we may not, we can only help the people that are in the situation, yeah. but we can save the people that are coming up. We don't, we don't have to have the same experience. The last, the, thank you, Jenny. This being such, the last plug I'm going to make on that is that we've talked a lot about women. For men, we know it's completely different. And we know there's lots of, again, societal gender differences which make it very difficult for men so we're going to be launching men in sheds and I would really love the over 50s forum to support us with this because we know you've got a wide membership and we need to make this a success we can you know in Essex they've got 37 sheds and, and it's amazing and the shed will be you know co-produced it's for men by men not just essentially just for men but we know that there's there's there's, there's gaps and, and it was a really safe place so we'd love you to be to be involved in that and help us get that off the ground so do give us a message about that and see what we can do because again it's like you know there's a space where guys can talk about their things and our coordinator is fantastic and he went along to this group and and, and they, they were talking about they were you know they were, they were busy doing an activity and then one of them said something to another one about i don't know erectile dysfunction or something and then these group of guys were having a conversation which they never would have had at any other time but because they were busy doing the piece of work they had a conversation so so again you could say oh maybe you should see a doctor about that so it gives people a chance to get help in a safe environment rather than you if you if you want to talk about that no one would turn up at all but if it's in a shed maybe that goes on and just the person that's the coordinator is switched on to know oh if you go see over 50s they could tell you a bit more about that it helps so let's connect everybody to get that going because we really need it in Enfield so thank you so so much um equally prevalent in both genders it always seems to be quite favorably disadvantaged to women I have to say it's really interesting I'm looking at this whole link between menopause too I think it's because I'm aging myself but there are, there are lots of things that are quite concerning but one of the things that really does annoy me is NHS dentists let's just get that out there our teeth again our kind of gates to our health it's preventative work it's important for us to have accessible affordable dentistry and the pandemic's caused us a bit of a problem of that but there's a lot of link factors to you know gum disease which then produces vascular issues which then can put it you know potentially cause dementia so there's a lot of preventative stuff we need to do in, and eating exercising etc cetera, etc cetera. and i know you guys have got a fantastic event on the 15th of november to share all that information at as well at the over 50s forum at fusion so we'll see you there but everyone wants to email me you're welcome to i'm happy to come back again at another time and try and rein myself in and thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you everybody for your contribution today it's been fabulous i'm very excited thank you again alison it's absolutely brilliant thank you very much at this stage normally we'd clap but <laughs> i'm afraid that doesn't really work online but uh, thank you very much indeed and thanks to everyone for coming <laughs>